is Samurai Myth Conceptions, uh, the truth of the legendary Japanese warrior. <clears throat> First of all, I'm a scholar, not a linguist. Uh, I have studied Japanese. I'm not fluent in it. Uh, occasionally, I will regress to an earlier form of study and I'll mispronounce something. Or I'll simply start talking too quick and I'll screw it up. Uh, <clears throat> one thing to remember in Japanese, all of the vowels are always pronounced the same. A is A, A, E, O, and U. They don't have different types. Uh, so the name Ikeda is Ikeda, not Aikida. Occasionally, because I learn things wrong at first, I will occasionally pronounce Ikeda, Aikida. That's what I mean. Sometimes I'll regress back. Uh, Okami, which means wolf or uh, great god, basically is Okami. Uh, similarly, you'll find this, uh, particularly if you play Samurai Warriors or watch you know, the anime for it now. I'm not sure if they <coughs> switch it around. But a lot of stuff will switch the, fur, you know, the surname and the given name, uh, whatever you translate to the West. The proper way in most Asian cultures, particularly Japanese, is for the family name to come first. So the actor, the actor there, which by the way, all four of those scenes are the same guy at different uh, portions of his career. That is, you'll see him billed as Toshiro Mufune. He is Mufune Toshiro. Traditionally, he was uh, directed by Kurosawa Akira. Dragon Ball was made by Toriyama Akira. You'll see it backwards uh, most times in the West. I will be doing it with the proper surname, given name throughout this. So, <clears throat> Japan is comprised of four major islands and a couple of hundred uh, smaller ones. The four main islands in the north, Hokkaido, the main island of Honshu, we also have uh, Shikoku, uh, the small island in the center, and the southernmost island, Kyushu. <clears throat> During the time we're going to be talking about, Hokkaido is not talked about much at this point. It is still barbarian territory. Uh, the Ainu are essentially subjugated, however, they're largely autonomous. Uh, in Kyushu, important parts, important places, Tanagashima Island, this is where the Portuguese first land in 1530 and bring firearms. Uh, Nagasaki, <clears throat> during the Edo period, this was the only place where foreigners were allowed, up until, uh, well, up until we, the Americans, came and ruined it all for the Japanese. <clears throat> uh, we'll talk a bit about Nara, the Asuka Nara period. During that time, the capital was here in Nara. Uh, it then became here in Heian Kyo, currently called Kyoto. Uh, Heian Kyo simply means the Heian capital. Kyoto means Western capital. Uh, Tokyo here is the current capital. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, at that time, well, before it was called Tokyo, it was known as Edo. Before that, it was known as Chiba. Uh, Kamakura here, this is the capital of the first shogunate. We'll talk a bit about that, too. Uh, so this gives you a general map of where things are in the spectrum of things. So, the first myth we'll look at. Samurai, the ultimate warrior. These were you know, men of devout war status, and that was all that they worried about was war. Samurai itself actually means servant. <clears throat> uh, it comes from comes from the uh, root saburai, which was then bastardized into samurai. Uh, and it ultimately comes from the Chinese character Shi. Uh, if you'll notice, it is the same character. The way that the kanji works, the Japanese written language, it's basically Chinese characters that they then pronounce differently. <clears throat> Shi means attendant. And that's also where we get the alternative name for samurai, Bushi. Uh, we have more seats up front, you guys. Can sit down. <clears throat> uh, by the late Heian period, Bushi and Samurai were mostly interchangeable. And part of this was because most Samurai didn't actually call themselves Samurai. Because, as I said, Samurai means servant. You don't walk around going, yeah, I'm a servant. I'm the help. Uh, so they like to refer to themselves as the Bushi, or the Bouquet, the warrior cat. Uh, that's how they like to fashion themselves. They were a warrior rank. 
they served the Kuge, the court nobles. These were the legitimate aristocracy who ran the capital, and they in turn served the Koshitsu, the imperial family, the emperor, or empress at the time, various, uh, and the various princes of the imperial family. <clears throat> so what did they look like? We're going to look at modern media portrayals and compare that to what they actually look like. Uh, this is Shibata Katsuye from the, Sam the uh, Samurai Warriors games. We also have Sanada Kimura from Sengoku Basara, the anime. We have Honotara Katsu from the Samurai Warriors anime. And Anka Kuji Okei from the Onimusha games, Onimusha 2. And these in light warriors, I think. So, definitely stylistic descriptions, perhaps not what they actually look like. Take a look at a closer representation. <laughs> He's just as surprised as you are. That's a slightly more uh, realistic version of Shibata Katsuye. That's more based off of his realistic helmet and his realistic armor. Uh, on the left side there, I have a laser pointer. On the left side here, this is a uh, slightly more modern replica of what Sanada Yukimura actually wore in battle. And that is a statue of him. He's usually portrayed in media as this you know, beautiful young man. However, at the point when he gets most of his fame, he was actually renowned for having a beautiful mustache and beard. Most writings of him have him with beautiful facial hair he's regarded, and he's always a clean-shaven young man. <clears throat> There's a more modern artist, uh, I believe it's a painting, a painting of uh, Honda Tadakatsu. Uh, he was known for wearing a rosary in battle, he was a devout Buddhist, and he also had fire-like deer antlers on his helmet. He usually gets stylized a lot. Uh, his famous spear, the Konmogiri, uh, a lot different than the giant halberd that he's portrayed with uh, in Samurai Warriors. Uh, the name Konmogiri means dragonfly cutter. It comes from a story in his youth. He was sitting on a decorative uh, post, and a dragonfly landed on it. The blade was so sharp that as soon as it landed, it just sliced itself in half. So he named it the Konmogiri cutter, the dragonfly cutter. That's a slightly more uh, realistic version of Ankokuji Ake. He was by no means a warrior, although he was samurai. Uh, he was also a lay monk. He had taken up the Buddhist vows. That's why he's bald. He's taken up the tonsure. He's a Buddhist priest, but he also he works outside of the monastery. He's a lay monk, <clears throat> similar to Takeda Shingen and Wasuki Kenshin. They were both lay monks. Uh, Ankokuji Ake was not a large man at all. His nickname was uh, Motonari's Little Monk. Uh, because he served Mori Motonari, one of his uh, major advisors. But uh, I've always found it funny that in Onimusha they made him this big, hulking, you know, fat, muscular guy, and his nickname was Little Monk. In the Asuka period, uh, this is male dress and female dress. This was the common dress of the times for the nobility, this would be the Kuge. And really, at this point, we don't really have the samurai yet. They haven't really come into their own. At this point, the kuge are still the main point between the imperial family and the peasantry. Uh, you could argue that their servants would then be the samurai, but we really haven't developed this term strongly yet. And this would be the type of armor that they wore. Uh, some of this would be wicker armor, actually, just bound tightly together. Some of it would be they're starting to develop the lacquered wooden armor. Uh, the main idea of this is to stop an arrow at this point. Most of their battles are long-range archers firing at each other. Uh, we then get into the Nara period. Here we have masculine dress and feminine dress. These are actually dolls that I think are just really well done. Now we get into, uh, this is in 757, we have uh, a lower court noble, higher samurai. His samurai warriors that would serve him. Now we are starting to get into where samurai are coming out. <clears throat> they are serving the kuge. And this would be in the Heian period, Heian fashion. We have uh, a courtier, or a kuge. This would be what uh, higher ranking samurai or lower ranking kuge may wear. Uh, this up here is a type of iboshi, that is a helmet. It's based on the size. Uh, 
Prior to the Heian period, based on the size and color, you could tell a man's rank in court. Uh, you've got your hand up. I'll hit the questions right. later I have on. A very good question. I'm also a scholar. I'm just wondering, what is your degree in? And uh, like, what is your, your field? Uh, I don't have a degree in anything. I have worked as a historical ah. consultant on various games and books. Of the Iboshi. Uh, in earlier periods, the Asuka period, and Nara period, such, uh, they stole a lot from the Chinese idea of uh, Confucianist uh, size and color of the hats to determine what their rank in court was and what their job in court was. Eventually, this gave way to just the all black Iboshi. And you could tell by how it was worn and the size of it what their rank was. And if I remember correctly, uh, it's actually backwards what you might think. The smaller his hat, the more important he was. <clears throat> so as you can see, small hat, he's more important than this guy. Uh, this would be a palace guard in his regular day-to-day -day garb. You can see he's wearing uh, boots. Uh, in the earlier periods, bearskin boots were very popular. And this would be the court dress, or the day-to-day -day dress, of the average uh, kuge or samurai woman. This would be the armor they would wear. You can see they're now getting these large uh, sode, the shoulder pads. These are what they developed instead of a shield. In Europe, you have the shield. Here, the idea was this would block your head from an arrow. Once again, they're still primarily shooting at each other with bows and arrows. <clears throat> uh, they developed here Naginata. This would be an Ashigaru. This would be a Samurai. And this would be a Samurai Lord, perhaps a Kuge going into battle. This actually here, in this particular picture, is... Uh, Technically, Koshitsu. He is one of the emperor's sons. That is Shorino of Kagosuke. Uh, so this would be lower Koshitsu, higher ranking Kuge. Now we get into the Kamakura and Moromachi period. Whenever you see samurai stuff, now we're getting into what you're normally looking at. Uh, this would be male dress, female dress. You can see the kimono and his uh, hakama are firmly established with the fashion. The women wear uh, you know, layered kimonos. It's kimono over kimono over kimono over kimono. Uh, the higher ranking she is, the more layers she may wear. <clears throat> and here we have, you know, this is called the box style armor, popular in that time. It's uh, slightly more refined than you saw in the last picture. Uh, now, of course, this is a modern replica of what they would have worn at the time. Uh, you can see they're starting to get larger headpieces, uh, maidate, on their helmets. Uh, one thing you can arguably tell is the larger the headpiece and the closer the front it is, the more likely this is to be a commander because you can grab a hold of that in a fight. But that's not necessarily true. A lot of people may have worn this into their fighting. Uh, at this time, the idea of the battle is still archery. Sit back, shoot at each other. In the later Moromachi period and into the Izuchi Momoyama, now we're getting into the Sengoku period. This is, you know, the age of the country at war. This is whenever the samurai clans fought against each other on a constant basis. Here, the Kitakare is firmly established. I was going to wear mine today, but then it snowed, and I said, no, never mind. Uh, once again, women wearing layered kimonos. Uh, <clears throat> in this particular case, on top of his Kitakare, he uh, also has it's probably a haori, a type of jacket over knee. Uh, in battle, they would wear a jin baori. Uh, the jin baori in particular would have a, it would either have a single or a double slit in the back, uh, <clears throat> where they could wear their sword through without it catching on the jacket. And common armor of the time, uh, male and female. Uh, one thing we'll get into is that uh, the myth of the Japanese woman at the time, we'll touch on that a little bit later, but as you can see, a large intricate maidate, she's not wearing a helmet at this particular time, uh, he is wearing the Jin Bowery right in front, and what you can't see underneath them is it probably either has, like I said, a single slit or a double slit to facilitate his sword. <clears throat> Finally, we get into the Edo period, which lasted from the uh, 17th century to the uh, 19th. As I said, this is where Commodore Matthew Perry, not the guy from France, brought the black ships, 
well-armed ships into Tokyo Harbor, and he said, look, we want your stuff, so begin trading with us, or we'll just blast you out and conquer you. They eventually said, all right, and this is where we get into the Meiji period after that, uh, where, uh, if you're familiar with Roni Kenshin, it is after the Meiji Revolution has occurred. Uh, we're not gonna touch too much on past the Edo period, because at that point you start to get into Western influences, which change everything. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see he's got the uh, Hidatare with the Kami Shimono, or Kami, uh, I can't think of the abbreviation for it. Uh, just the Kami Shimo, yeah, Kami Shimono. He has unusually large cuts in his Akama, but uh, probably this is, uh, this is a photograph, this is late in the Edo period, he might not even wear this on a daily basis. Uh, I probably just wore it for his photo. Here, said Hitatare, she's wearing layered kimono as usual. Uh, in the Edo period, it became, it was a time of peace. It became more of, well, let's go back to what we like of the Asuka, the Heian, the uh, Tsuchimomoyama period, and we'll imitate that. Uh, we don't really have a solid example of Edo period armor, because, as I said, at this point, it's a time of peace. They've stopped increasing the technology of your armor. What I do have, though, if anybody's ever heard of the Shinsengumi, this is the actual armor of the Shinsengumi commander, Kong, uh, Kondo Isami. As you can see, it's nothing like the old ones. <clears throat> this is the armor you wear to assassinate people. He's got a loose helmet. He has, it's almost like Western chainmail. Uh, he's got small links in here, sewn onto an overshirt, and leather gloves. This is the kind of stuff that you would wear, it would be more comfortable, you're not going into battle, you're probably fighting in rooms as large as this, if not smaller. You don't need something to stop an arrow, you need something to protect you against a glancing blow from a knife or a sword. So, the soul of the samurai, the katana. This is the weapon that exemplifies the samurai, right? Not even. Get one more. Look at him, he's so surprised, that's all he brought was this giant sword. <clears throat> In reality, the samurai were traditionally mounted archers. They were cavalry uh, archers, that's why much of the early periods, they were designed around uh, archery combat. <clears throat> As I said, most of their armor was designed to stop an arrow. This is because they would gather, their men up, and they would sit on opposite sides of the field, they would hurl insults at each other, and then they would declare who they were. You know, I am this person, I'm from this family, I'm related to this person, I'm descended from that person. And then they would knock arrows out of their bows, and they would shoot each other. Until one of them either ran out of arrows and said, okay, I retire, or one of them took enough casualties and they said, all right, I'm going home, you win. And then if it was an orderly retreat, they would just retreat back to their own areas, if it was a rout, then whichever side wasn't routing would chase the other one down and kill as many of them as it could. <clears throat> you can see this is a uh, modern reenactment actor doing uh, their mounted archery. Uh, nowadays, they'd like to do it on beaches because you can put uh, big areas on uh, uh, roped off. They used to dig small trenches because the idea is that you gotta take his hands off the reins to shoot. So you dig a small trench, and that was how you would practice it. Uh, once you actually got into combat, it was hopeful that you could control your horse well enough with your knees. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, they had various different types of arrows, just they had in the West. Uh, one particular, the whistling bulb arrow, it was often used for starting the battle. They would fire it high up into the air, it wasn't really designed for killing, it was designed to catch the, uh, in a vaguely, you know, as most other medieval cultures, they were, uh, if not devoutly religious, they were especially uh, superstitious. So the idea was catch the eye of the uh, kami so they could watch the battle and watch over the uh, warriors. <clears throat> they could also fire them en masse, and the idea was all of these whistling bulb arrows, which made like a <whistles> sound, would disturb the morale of the opposing side. One of the types of arrows they had was known as a lace cutter arrow. It had a barbed head like this, 
It wasn't so much designed to wound the other, per the other person as it was to cut the strings of his armor. So his armor would fall off, and then you do brush in and stab him a lot easier. Uh, you can also see X, that one's X. <clears throat> you can also see that the bows are in a strange shape. Uh, they're not holding it like this in the middle like you would normally see. They're holding it more like this. And the reason is because they are cavalry archers. This way, they can move the bow around and they're not hooking it onto the horse. Uh, <clears throat> this creates uh, uh, the strange shape of the bow. Even foot archers, because this is simply what they were used to using, would still, on, uh, you know, on foot, would still use uh, that style of bow, the Yumi. Uh, they did use what's called a Hongkyu, which is a half bow. It's roughly half the size of the full-size Yumi. This would be used a lot on horseback as well. Uh, it was easier to move around, but it wasn't nearly as strong as with any type of bow. <clears throat> so, of course, Chanbara Dutu. That was from Sword of Doom. Uh, it's a good movie for its fight scenes. The plot is a little weird, and uh, the ending is crap. <laughs> <coughs> the, the, it builds up to such a point, and then nothing comes to fruition, and credits roll. The, there's three separate subplots that all come together like this, and then credits roll. Uh, <clears throat> but it is good for the fight scenes. Uh, but naturally, that's how you always see, you know, samurai fighting with the swords. However, in reality, as I said, they were archers. Yeah. <clears throat> Even in Seven Samurai, they show how well uh, Gorobe and Kanbe are. And as you can see there, even though he's on foot, he's still using the cavalry bow. <clears throat> <clears throat> example of this is the story of Minamoto no Mitsuru and Taro no Yoshifumi. Uh, <clears throat> this is before the Genpei War, when the Taira and Minamoto were still essentially allies, <clears throat> but they were rival clans. Uh, <clears throat> these are guys who worked alongside each other, uh, they have lands close to each other, <clears throat> and they respect each other, but because of busybodies who are like, you know, my boss is better than yours, you know, my boss is better than yours. They wind up becoming rivals, and it comes to the point of, no, I'm definitely better than you. The other one's saying, no, I'm definitely better than you. <clears throat> it comes to blows. They challenge each other to a battle. Each guy goes back to his home, gathers up all of his warriors. His, you know, these are samurai gathering up their lower-ranking samurai to serve them, and they go out into a field. They challenge each other. Okay, this is a battle between men, so they fight each other. <clears throat> the way they fight is they ride each other on horseback, and shoot arrows at each other. One guy fires, the other one dodges in the saddle. Then he loads a bow on, he fires, the other guy dodges in the saddle. They each fire twice, at which point they go back to their own lines and say, I think we've both proven them ourselves, let's go home. <laughs> and they do. Not a single casualty. They wind up becoming best of friends and uh, work alongside each other for the rest of their lives. <coughs> Fortunately, by the Sengoku period, it doesn't turn out that way a lot. <clears throat> <laughs> Try not to take it to heart if you thought Chanbara duels were how they did. <laughs> he destroys that monster. <laughs> so, as we mentioned, samurai women. So the myth is that only men were samurai. You know, samurai were the warrior class. The reality is, samurai were a social caste. Women born in the samurai clans were sa considered samurai as well. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but you'll see a lot, you know, samurai men, you know, you'll see people say, you know, women weren't strong enough to be samurai. It wasn't a matter of strength. There were a lot of men who weren't strong enough to be samurai, technically. <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned, Uncle Fuji AK, he was technically samurai. He was not... You know, whether or not he could even use a sword is debatable. He was a religious man, 
He was a very small man. He was probably smaller than I am. I'm 5'6". Uh, he was probably only 5'1", five 5'2". Five if that, I am the uh, height of the average Japanese man at the time, so he may have only been four and a half feet tall. Who knows? <clears throat> <clears throat> the other myth is that women were expected to be demure, doll-like creatures, you know, only speak when spoken to, they were eye candy. <clears throat> in reality, though, I'll get to the question back first, sorry. Uh, in reality, though, uh, Japanese women at the time were trained in the arts of war just like the men were. Uh, and the reason for this is partially because when the men were away fighting, if the castle was attacked, it was the woman's job to defend the castle. Uh, if the man was out you know, even peasant women, if the man was out in the fields and the woman was at home cooking, it was her job to defend the house and the children if robbers came in and attacked. Uh, <clears throat> now, samurai women would have, would have been trained better than uh, peasant women, of course, but samurai men were trained better than peasant men. Even uh, peasant men conscripted in the army, uh, a lot of times they would have no armor, they would be giving uh, a sharpened piece of bamboo as their spear, uh, and it depended upon the wealth of the lord who was conscripting them, how many men he might have, and how much he figured this might actually come to blows and win him something. <clears throat> Even if he was the wealthiest lord in the land, if he knew this was just, uh, for lack of a better term, a pissing contest, <clears throat> we're going to get into opposite sides of the field, we might shoot each other, and then we're going to go home. Well, I'm not going to spend, you know, the equivalent of a million dollars to outfit my entire army, especially since I know they're going to go home and sell this stuff after the battle. <clears throat> uh, yeah. uh, the woman's job at the home was also to handle the finances. Uh, it was uh, unbecoming of a samurai to haggle. So whenever a samurai went to the market, if he saw something, yeah, I'd like that, how much is it? The merchants, who were peasants, <clears throat> would say, oh, it's 100 mon. The samurai might look at it and say, it's not worth more than 70. His job is to go, well, <clears throat> it's nice, but, oh, I don't need it. And that was the cue of, I don't want to pay that much for it. Because if he says, well, how about 70? You're haggling money. What are you, a peasant? <clears throat> so he could lose faith. And to the point that possibly, you know, rumors start and, well, <clears throat> He's clearly not a very good samurai. He probably can't even use a sword. He haggles for, you know, goods. Let's demote him in rank, or at least pass him over for promotion. <clears throat> uh, samurai women would uh, even be expected to participate in war if uh, necessary. There are numerous accounts of women accompanying their husbands into battle. I just absolutely love her face, because she's got this look like, Ooh! Who's making the sandwich tonight? <laughs> uh, the uh, story of Tomoe Gozen, who still may not be a historical person, or she may be based on you know, a roughly named person. Uh, first of all, anytime you see names like that, you know, Tomoe Gozen, uh, Herate Gozen, uh, Gozen simply means woman. That means, you know, mistress or lady. So it was Lady Tomoe. <clears throat> uh, Shizuka Tomoe you'll see a lot, too. Uh, I can't remember the name of the battlefield at the time. Too stupid to write it down before I came here. Uh, but they've recently found a lot of corpses, a mass grave, uh, and in exhuming the bodies, they've discovered that a significant portion, around, I think, 3 to 5 percent of the bodies were women. So these were the soldiers in the defeated army. So three to five percent of them were women participating in the battle alongside the men, uh, which was a shakeup for the uh, scholarly community whenever we discovered, oh, it's not just the random Tomoe goes in. Uh, they actually may have participated a lot more than we just, uh, you know, normally respect, particularly in sieges. A more, uh, an honor, uh, a more modern uh, actor's recreation. Uh, she still has, you know, the painted face. However, that was not necessarily just a womanly thing. The men of the time that she's portraying would also be dressed like that. Uh, as you can see, she's got the Nayanata. She's got a quiver of arrows on her back. So she's equipped with the full samurai accoutrements, as a man would have. <clears throat> so what was a samurai's purpose? As we've talked about, you know, 
They were the warrior cats. In uh, Yamamoto Sumitomo's Hagakure, he says, I have found the way of the samurai is death. This means that when you are compelled to choose between life and death, you must choose quickly. So the idea of the samurai was to fight and die. In uh, Miyamoto Masashi's Book of the Five Rings, Go to Nosho, it says, Generally speaking, the way of the warrior is resolute acceptance of death. So that was the idea of the samurai. You go out, you find a battle, you fight, and you know, if necessary, or even if not necessary, you die. The way of the samurai is death. However, in 1336, Tsuchimochi Nobuhide reported to his master, we suffered severe casualties, our forces went into nothing, and we fled. <laughs> he wasn't even on the losing side. He was just in the thick of things and said, you know, we were taking too heavy of casualties, we went back home. These are the heads we took on the way though. <laughs> and he would still be rewarded. All right, you know, that's good. I still have men serving me, so not my entire force died. Okay, <clears throat> now blatant cowardice may be, you know, punished, but getting into the thick things and saying, all right, we're going to lose, we got to, you know, take a step back and regroup, that was just the, you know, proper battle. The samurai loved Sun Tzu's art of war. Sun Tzu doesn't shy away from, you know, don't lose the battle for pride. He's the first one to say, if you need to withdraw, withdraw. He has an entire chapter of his book dedicated to Picking the right terrain for battle. If the terrain's not right for you, don't fight. Withdraw as far back as you need to to win the war in the end. <clears throat> so, but with that though, samurai were totally dedicated to battle, right? No. Uh, the Code of Bushido, the Japanese idea of chivalry. This governed, you know, loyalty to one's master, you know, resolute acceptance of death. All of this, this is what governed the samurai way. In reality, the Code of Bushido wasn't really codified until the Edo period, when they had 250 straight years of relative peace. <clears throat> the idea was, the samurai is a warrior caste. We no longer have war. So, the samurai are starting to misbehave. We need to re-educate them with this Code of War to make them remember, your warriors, act like it, but don't kill each other anymore because we're at peace. And that's what Bushido was designed for. <clears throat> uh, it was based on what are called house codes that several daimyo of the Sengoku period and a little bit earlier had designed. These were rules for their own samurai. And the uh, Tokugawa govern, you know, uh, government, the Bakufu, who gathered together you know, and eventually codified Bushido, uh, they looked at a lot of different house codes and said, we like this, we like that, we like that, we don't like that, and here we are. This is now Bushido. Uh, particular people they borrowed from a lot, uh, Magwa Sadeo, uh, Hojo Son, Kato Kiyomasa, and Asakori uh, Soteki, uh, Asakura Soteki, uh, they borrowed from a lot. Uh, Kato Kiyomasa is where you get a lot of stuff about, you know, pure warrior. Uh, he was a pure warrior. In his house codes, he said, if a man practices poetry, he should be put to death. Uh, if a man dances, dancing is wrong. Warriors don't dance. Warriors kill other people. If you dance in my castle, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> he was sometimes known as Torakato, which is Tiger Kato. This is because while the Japanese were fighting the Koreans during uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi's uh, Korean invasions in the 1590s, sometimes he would get bored during sieges, and he would go out and spear hunt tigers. <laughs> so the reality was, samurais love tea parties and poetry. <laughs> yeah, except at Kato Kiyomasa's house. Don't bring your tea set to Kiyomasa's house, he'll stab you. And then probably, then probably stuff you and put you beside one of his tigers. <clears throat> A great story of this is Taira no Taranori. This is now into the Gempei War. This is once the Taira and the Minamoto have gone to war with each other. The Taira have won the last two wars, but the Minamoto have rebuilt, and they're now winning the third war, the big one. Taira is on the losing side. Uh, Kyoto is about to fall at this time, but Kyoto is about to fall, so his army is retreating. 
He's one of the commanders of the Tyra army. They're several miles away. Whenever he remembers, my poetry mentor is compiling an imperial anthology, I forgot to give him my poems. He rides back. Now, they have been doing a scorched earth policy. Every farm they hit, they burn it. So this way, if the uh, Minamoto follow them, there's no food for them in the coming war. He's now going through what is very angry territory to him. Uh, he's not quite alone. He's probably got some samurai attendants with him, maybe five or ten. He rides into Kyoto, which is already starting to come into Minamoto hands. They've burnt part of the city. He rides up to his uh, master's house and patiently waits for his master to accept his appointment. <clears throat> when he gets there, he says, I know because of the war, uh, you've been told to stop at the anthology, but I know once the war is over, you will restart your anthology. And you'll gather up all the, po you know, all the best poems of the poets of this time, and he pulls from the breastplate of his armor a sheet of 100 poems. He says, I hope that at least one of these is good enough to include in the anthology. <clears throat> I know that we're gonna lose, I'm gonna die. It would mean the world to me and more. He even promises, if you include one of my poems, my spirit will come back and protect you. And then he rides back away. A few years later, he dies in one of the battles. <clears throat> Eventually, his poem, one of his hundred poems, is included in the Senzai Shu, the anthology being put together by his master. Fortunately, at this point, his entire family is considered to be rebels. It's put in anonymously. And it's centuries later that we decide this is definitely one of his poems. But that was how important poetry was to the samurai, was he wrote back risking death and brutal capture and torture just to make sure that one of his poems is included. <clears throat> By the way, the poem is about plums. <clears throat> you, you might think, oh, it's definitely got to be about battles. No, it's about the plums in a city that nobody lives in anymore. Uh, an eccentric emperor decided, I don't like the capital, I want to live over there. So he moved the capital like 20 miles north of Le you know, on Lake Biwa and said, Shiga, that's my new capital. After he died a decade later, everybody said, let's go back to Kyoto. It's nicer there. <laughs> so everybody moved away. Uh, everybody moved away back to Kyoto and it wound up in the ruins. And he talks about how, yeah, it's ruins, nobody lives there, but the plums still look <laughs> uh, they also developed the ball game Kamari. It's kind of like hacky sack with a giant ball. The idea is it's uh, kind of a team sport. All the samurai get together and they all kick this leather ball. And the idea is kick it to somebody and try to keep it up in the air as long as possible. And they would do these in these courtrooms that I showed you all those pictures of. You can't imagine how fun that was. The Chano Yu, the tea ceremony. Uh, that's a picture of Imai Sokyu who was actually a merchant of the time, he's carrying a teapot. <clears throat> it became a very stylistic ritual idea. You go in, uh, part of it is uh, you enter through a small door only about this big, and this is to bring you back to your humble roots. You have to crawl to get into the building. You then sit around, uh, the host whisks the tea leaves, and pours the tea out, and he hands it to the guest of honor. He will lift it up, bow, bow to everyone else, take a sip, pull out his handkerchief, wipe it off, turn it, give it to the next guy, and they do this the entire time. <coughs> hmm? Uh, you would, some of these cups were imported from China. They were, you know, it, the equivalent today of like, perhaps I bought a thousand dollar teapot and five hundred dollar cups. So this is, look at how awesome my cup is, take a drink from it. It's the best cup you've ever seen, isn't it? <coughs> <coughs> Ma uh, Matsunaga Hisahide. Uh, he's definitely the villain of pretty much any story you'll read on him. Uh, it was so important whenever he rebels against Oda Nobunaga, Nobunaga besieges his castle and he says, look, surrender the castle and I'll be merciful. Uh, I won't, you know, crucify you upside down or anything. I'll just, like, cut your head off. Surrender the castle, I'll spare your men, most of them at least, uh, but part of the surrender terms, I want your really famous teapot, the Hiragumo, uh, which is something or the spider, I can't think what it is now. But the Hiragumo, very important tea kettle. He's like, if you don't give me the tea kettle, I won't honor the surrender terms. So Hisahide says, well, you don't get anything. <laughs> Open the gates, let Nobunaga in, surrender. But he filled, he packed it with gunpowder, put a fuse into it, 
And after he committed seppuku and his son cut off his head, he said, wrap it around my head and light the fuse so Nobunaga can't get my head or my hiragumo. <laughs> <clears throat> that was how important tea items were. As I said, they spent a fortune importing them from China. They would build them, yeah, build them. They would uh, craft them in Japan. Uh, they had entire schools. If you could craft a good pot, you were set for life. There's also waka and kanji poems. As I mentioned, uh, Tarano Taranori and his poetry, uh, they had very stylistic rules for poems. These tea ceremonies often became uh, either the host would recite part of a poem, it's called Renga, linked to verse. Uh, he would uh, basically recite a haiku, five, seven, five for syllables, and he would turn to the guest of honor. It's your turn to add on to that. And he would do two seven syllable lines on top of that. They would do competitions. If there were four people, you know, she and I are a group, you two are a group, so we're going to try to see which one of us can do the best poem. Take the wrong person. <laughs> <clears throat> By the way, waka is Japanese poetry, kanshi is Chinese poetry. It just depended on which style they were doing. Uh, this Kano and Ukiyo-e painting, the earlier stages, Kano-style painting uh, was popular. There was an entire school devoted to it. Uh, Ukiyo-e painting became popular in the Edo period. Uh, and we get to poems that so importantly have the jisei, the death poems. Before you die, uh, if you were a true samurai, you would write a poem. Ashikaga Yoshitaru was the 13th Ashikaga Shogun. He was Shogun from 1546 to his death in 1565. Uh, if you've heard of a samurai with the uh, name Teru in the Sengoku period, he's probably named after this guy. Uh, Yoshitaru knew he didn't have a whole lot of power. He was trying to restore the power of the Shogunate, so he became essentially the godfather to uh, a lot of young samurai. Uh, Nagao Teru Toro, also known as Sugi Kenshin, uh, Mori Terumoto, Date Terumune, he said, I don't have anything to give, I'm poor, I'm bankrupt, I barely have an army, but I have an important name, and you can have a piece of it. Thank you. Uh, his death poem as Matsunaga Hisihide, the guy I mentioned that blew his own head up, uh, attacks him, decides, nope, we can't have a powerful shogun, we're going to install your 11-year-old second cousin, third, you know, thrice removed, we're going to get rid of you. <clears throat> so, Yoshitaru is a true warrior. He is a guy that engaged in Chambara. Once his uh, palace was invaded, he put up the tatami mats into triangles so that they couldn't use their spears, and he broke or dulled a dozen swords, killing dozens of men invading his palace. The uh, Hisahide eventually decided, he's too dangerous, let's just set the house on fire. And that's what they did. They fired flaming arrows at it, caught his house on fire, and as he committed seppuku in the burning house, he wrote, <clears throat> which is, the May rain falls, and is it my tears or the mist that surround me? Singing cuckoo bird, take my name and soar above the clouds. That was his final poem, and then he committed seppuku, cut himself open, and had his head cut off. <clears throat> so, of course, as we've talked about, you know, samurai had two options, death in battle or seppuku. Uh, here we have the story of Date Tarumune, who I just mentioned. He's kidnapped by a fellow daimyo. He is by this point retired, and Date Masamune, his son, has taken over the clan. Masamune is engaging in war and everybody around him. So Matakayama Yoshitsugu gathers Tarumune up for a tea party and says, look, can you convince your son to stop fighting me? And Tarumune says, he's the boss now, what am I going to do? And Takayama says, well, this is what you're going to do. You're going to come with me. Takes him hostage. Masamune finds out about it and follows. They're now on opposite sides of the river. And uh, uh, Terumune says, what are you doing? You have riflemen. Shoot them. Masamune reluctantly opens fire. Uh, in the battle, his father dies. Yoshitsugu actually manages to make an escape. And this creates the Date uh, Hatakayama War that lasts for the next decade. His goal is to kill Yoshitsugu in revenge. <clears throat> of course, Oda Nobunaga betrayed by Akechi Mitsuhide at Honoji. Uh, somewhat similar to Yoshitsugu, uh, or sorry, Yoshitaru. Uh, he fights a little bit, he's wounded, he goes back, commits seppuku, and burns up in the fire. Uh, 
<clears throat> we also have seppuku, of course, the uh, legal, essentially, art of suicide. The idea was uh, you would take your knife or your dagger, uh, if you were uh, you know, a real man, you would cut once horizontally and once vertically. Not a whole lot of people managed to do that. <clears throat> uh, by the Sengoku period, it has now developed the Kaishakunin, or the Kaishaku, a second who would stand there with a sword at the ready, uh, and once he decided that you were about to lose your composure, he would cut your head off for you. Uh, a lot of times, this would be as soon as you jabbed it in, he would go. Because if you, call, you, if you cried out in pain, you dishonored yourself. Uh, particularly for older fellows, they may just grab the knife. They may be too frail to lift the knife and do a good cut. As soon as they grab the knife, cut his head off uh, out of respect. Now, it's kind of funny. The poem there is the Jisei for Toyotomi Hideyoshi. He actually died of natural causes. It was just the best picture I could find. <clears throat> so, in reality, the number one cause of death for samurai was old age and disease. Many of them did die in battle. It was a time of war. But Fukita Hide died at the age of 90 of old age. Now, to be fair, he died in 1662. In 1600, he was on the defeated side and was exiled. So he lived a life of you know, luxury and exile. Wesuki Kenshin died of stomach cancer and psoriasis of the liver because he was a raging alcoholic at the age of 48. <clears throat> so, all right, you've got alcoholism and disease and a guy who lived to be 90, although most of his life was in luxury and exile. She was a Yoshihiro, died at the age of 84 of old age, survived 52 separate battles, at least, not all of which he won. He was defeated in several battles, wounded a few times even, but managed to live to, uh, to 84. A great example is Ryuzoji Iekane, who I don't have a picture of, uh, though I searched for hours. <clears throat> he lived at the age of 92. He fought his last battle at the age of 90. Whenever he was 88, 89, a, uh, a Baba Yori Chika, uh, another samurai who was jealous of his uh, wealth and esteem, ambushed him killed much of uh, Iekane's family. Iekane managed to narrowly flee, gathered up his army, led the invasion against Baba Yorichika's land, won the battle, won the war, killed Yorichika, and still lived for two more years after that before dying of old age. <coughs> so, uh, about 10 minutes, I am behind schedule. Uh, so we'll run through this last part. Myth is that the samurai were you know, noble warriors who fought on the battlefield. Most ninja that we know are, were actually of the samurai caste. Hattori Hanzo, uh, arguably Fuma Kozuro, uh, Momochi Sandyu. These were all samurai. Most of the samurai unit of names, of, or most of the ninja unit of names of in history were samurai. While ninja were highly trained infiltrators and assassins, I had that in the wrong order. <laughs> uh, there were actually three classes of ninja. Uh, if you know, if you've watched Naruto, you have the base of this idea. In reality, Jonin weren't high class ninja. They were the samurai who ruled the clan. Momochi Sandyu, uh, Fumakotoro, Hattori Hanzo. The Junin were the captains. These were often samurai as well. Genin were often peasants trained in infiltration. Uh, the idea that ninja used smoke bombs and shuriken, you know, the samurai used their swords and their spears. In reality, in the cords that would be in the handle, samurai would hide senbon and shuriken. The idea was whenever you're running at a guy with a sword, before you draw your sword, pull a needle or you know, a spike out and throw it at him. If nothing else, he'll just kind of dodge it and you can cut him with, his, you know, with your sword. <clears throat> so what did the ninja look like? We all know what ninja looked like. They look like that. <laughs> <coughs> In reality, they probably look more like this. They wore disguises. He is a Shinto priest. He would wear, you know, Shinto priests could get almost anywhere. Nobody would suspect them. Uh, they might dress as a merchant. Uh, actually, the uh, kunai knives that you see, that wasn't a ninja weapon. That was the weapon of a merchant. Merchants would use that to cut open boxes and to cut, you know, twine. So, ninja used that a lot because they would be dressed like a merchant. 
a merchant could carry that and nobody would think about it. And the loop is to hang from his belt. So he could pull from his belt and stab someone real easy. So, courtship. How do they get married? So first off, well, first of all, uh, a myth that I've seen, which I think is ridiculous, is the Japanese don't even have a word for love. And in reality, they have numerous words for love, and they've had them for years. Beitobore uh, means falling deeply in love. Erokoi means purely sexual affection, lust. Hatsukoi, puppy love, the first crush. Aishitaru, I love you. Most Japanese don't say, oh, Aishitaru, Aishitaru mon because it's for the soap operas. Most Japanese people will tell each other, Daisuke, you're different, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> and of course we have Miko no Mochi, the third night rice cake. What? what? Get to that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> so, courtship and marriage in Hei in Japan. Now by the Edo period, it was, you meet somebody, there are specifically people, just like in Mulan, uh, there are specifically people who, you know, you're a guy, you're a girl, I'll find, you know, the right guy and girl for each of you and pair you up together, that's my job and you're going to pay me for it. But in Hay in Japan, <clears throat> you meet with a lady or her parents, uh, you arrange a date, and the date would always be, the women always lived with their parents, it would be at their house. You would go over to the parents' house, you would meet with the woman, <clears throat> and you would converse with her, you would recite poetry with her, you would just talk about things, have your head uh, you would then spend the night in her bedroom. You could make any guess what you were doing. But you had to be gone by sunrise. If you were caught there, it was an insult to her family. It would create a rivalry, possibly a war. You might even just be executed on the spot if they were high ranking enough. <coughs> Step six, you write her a letter about how much you enjoyed being with her. She would then consider your, poet, your, your poetic grammar and your calligraphy and decide, are you worth having a second date with? It was up to her. <laughs> if she liked you, second date occurs, you spend the night in her bedroom again, once again, gone by sunrise. Repeat step six and seven. You write her another poem, tell her how much you enjoy being with her. She decides, all right, your poetry is still good, uh, your calligraphy is good. So step ten, you get a third date. You spend the night in her bedroom, and you get caught by her parents in the morning. And they act surprised. Remember, you came, came in through the front door, they know you're there, they know you're sharing and her daughter, so they come in and go, who are you? Oh no! <clears throat> and then you have breakfast with her parents. This is the Mika no Mochi, the third night rice cake. You have a breakfast of rice cakes with her. Congratulations, you're married. <laughs> that was the wedding ceremony, the third night rice cake. <clears throat> Let's go through just a couple of funny ones. Funny myth, once a katana is drawn, samurai is not allowed to sheath it until it draws blood. Putting it back in the uh, scabbard. You're mistaking samurai for psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> it was considered unseemly for samurai to actually draw his sword if he wasn't intended to use it. <clears throat> but it was always more preferred to sheath a clean blade than to have unnecessary debt. Uh, judo or jujutsu was designed to negate the benefits of a samurai sword. In reality, Jujutsu, or Aikido, or such, was designed to complement a samurai's weapon. Uh, <clears throat> several katas, several patterns that you would use in Aikido, actually involve uh, sitting in court and somebody trying to grab your sword, trying to fight them off, and even draw the sword and use it. Uh, one popular technique is they grab your sword, you grab them by the wrist, use the handle of your sword as a fulcrum point, flip them over, pull it out, and stab them. <coughs> uh, boom! <coughs> as I said, women would be trained in these arts as well. Last one I love, Hakama were designed to hide the footwork of the fighter wearing them. As you can see in that picture, it's not going to hide anything. It's high enough up that it doesn't cover his feet. This is because he's probably wearing it outside, and he doesn't want it to drag on the ground. In reality, they're just really comfy. <coughs> It also came in many styles. You saw it in the, uh, I believe it was the Nara period one. He actually has his Akama tucked into his boots. Uh, <clears throat> for anyone who's curious, Dick Jutsu is not as dirty as it sounds. My name is Richard. Uh, I was named after my grandfather, Dick. Jutsu is Japanese for style or technique. It is my technique, my style. I use it to hawk my books. And I am also the guy. Okay, see what I did there? Oh, okay. He sees what I did there. 
You also see what I did over there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm also the guy behind the camera. Sorry, she's the woman behind the camera. I'm the guy in front of the camera for the YouTube uh, uh, educational web series, Samurai Guide In, where I talk about this stuff the first Friday of every month. And we can hit one or two questions if anybody's got some. Go ahead. Let's see here. If uh, women back in olden times <coughs> were uh, you know, considered on the same vein, where did the whole Yamada Nanashiko thing come in? Well, <clears throat> it was still a patriarchal society. The women were uh, not quite second-class citizens as we might think of them, but uh, you know, a woman perhaps would not be trained to the same level as a man. Although in some cases women were trained more than men. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for instance, in the Battle of Sekigahara, nobody wanted to serve Ishida Mitsunari because he wasn't a warrior, he was a bureaucrat. Uh, <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, around the same uh, few years earlier, Tachibana Dosetsu, who was known as Demon Dosetsu because he was a paralyzed uh, man, he had been struck by lightning. He drew his sword and was struck by lightning, which is why his sword was named the Riker. Uh, the, the, the legend that he spread was that he was going to be struck by lightning and he sliced the lightning bolt in half. <laughs> <clears throat> but it paralyzed him on one side. It was after that that he told, you know, that he adopted it, or not adopted, but he was given the name Demon Dosetsu because he still won a bunch of battles after that. He had to be carted around in a palanquin, but he was a strategic genius. He never had any sons. He only had one daughter, uh, usually referred to as Ginchio. Excuse me. Uh, he left the entire clan to her. He was okay with that, but most of the clan elders said, we're not gonna serve a woman. So she was forced to marry her brother, her adopted brother. <clears throat> he adopted a guy uh, named Munashige by marrying him to his daughter. This was a, actually a common thing. Uh, you could adopt a person as Wasugi Kenshin had no uh, children of his own. He was celibate his whole life. He took his vow of monkhood seriously. So he adopted two uh, young men. Uh, Kagekatsu. Kagetora. Kagetora, thank you. Uh, Kagekatsu and Kagetora, who upon his death fought each other for who would succeed. Uh, <clears throat> but neither one of them were actually related to Kenshin. Uh, in Japan, it was more important for the name to continue than for the bloodline to, uh, to continue. Uh, it didn't matter if you were related to me, as long as you took my name and continued the clan. Uh, the clan can continue on and on and on and on for generations and centuries, as long as we continue with this name. Uh, but even with that, the women were still, uh, and especially into the Edo period, we start getting Western influences into the Meiji period, and it becomes, well, now the women are supposed to be demure. That's, that's where the myth comes from. Uh, you know, by that point, the women were demure, you know, we had uh, European influences. Uh, <clears throat> there's one uh, person who came with the Jesuits in the 16th century who wrote back home that Japanese women have more rights than the average European man. But even so, a Japanese man would have more rights. Uh, well, she's unhooking everything. If anybody has any other quick questions, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you. Uh, um, did, did you like have to be a certain age to be like um, a samurai, or? Uh, as I said, once you were born in the samurai caste, you were samurai. You become a warrior. Uh, you were usually considered a man between like 11 and 14. Uh, if you, you know, didn't really become a man until 18, you were kind of considered to be, uh, you know, second class or such. <clears throat> Usually by 15, they would have their uh, Genroku, uh, sorry, Genpaku, which is where they would get their first set of uh, men's clothing. Uh, they would uh, went for suit cut their for bangs suit because uh, boys at the time often had this shave, but kept their bangs. If you ever seen a picture of that, they would shave their bangs and wear their first top knot. Uh, they would also oftentimes get their first sword at that time. Uh, and that was the point where you'd really become a man. Uh, Date Masamune fielded his first battle at the age of 14, I believe. Uh, uh, Ashikaga Yoshituru became shogun at the age of 11. 
They really liked installing 11 year olds because they thought they were controllable. Until about the time they hit 25 or 30, and then they'd tell them to install the next 11 year old. Uh, go ahead. I have only actually read the first volume of it, so I can't really accurately say, you know, what happens beyond that point. Oh, yeah, or no, not at all. Yeah, I'm sorry. <clears throat> uh, go ahead. What do you think of Shogun, the miniseries? Uh, I think it sucks, honestly. <laughs> it is a very stylistic portrayal of Sekigahara. Uh, however, uh, Tokugawa is Totonaga, Ishida is Ishido, but it brings, I uh, believe, Blackthorn, that is his name. Blackthorn is based off a guy named William Adams. Uh, it makes him much more important than he was. Uh, one of the things that I remember from it is when Ishido ambushes uh, Toronaga's men and Blackthorn. Uh, they fight one-on-one -on -one duels until eventually Toronaga's men are defeated. They wouldn't have done that. They would have fought each other and tried to rush out of there. Uh, it's just a very stylistic way. It's where we get a lot of, it's actually where we get a lot of our myths from, is that because that helped to bring samurai to the West, but it came with a very flawed depiction of them. So personally, I don't like it. Go ahead. I just want to say, now scanning, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Good. Good. Have you ever heard of a manga slash anime series called Kyuge Mono? It's a, it takes place around, I think, the Sengoku period around when Yorinaga is still around, and it's, mostly about the whole tea ceremony thing that you brought up. I believe the wall-eyed guy that I used in there yeah. is from that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I recently learned about it. I haven't had the opportunity to watch it yet. Yeah, I've watched about three <coughs> episodes of it. I'm, it's rather slow going, but I'm enjoying it so far, so maybe you would like it too. I'll have to look into it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.